It's the big interview with Harry Kuehl. Harry, um, you, you've, you've pressed pause on your life, which we're grateful for because it's not a big secret to reveal that we're talking to you on the big interview during the international break. And anybody who works as hard as a coach in football deserves to get their free time. So first of all, thank you. It's good to have you on the, on the big interview. You're not the first Australian. But oh, well, I'm good. going then. <laughs> I'm not the first Australian I'm going. Had, had we been, been able to contact you previously, you'd have been the first interview. Never mind, eight mm. years ago, you'd have been the very first interview. Um, Harry, we're going to talk a lot about what a gifted, elegant footballer you were. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Well, you were. Balance, movement, pure striker of the ball in your era in the Premier League. Immensely gifted about that ability to know when to arrive in a space or to create a space. It's just really, really enjoyable to watch you in all the guises since you came to Britain. Um, but, but let's start with something that you've opened Pandora's box because you've talked about an era that our listeners, we have, we've, we've had 25 million listens since we began this. So we know our eras, we know what our, our listeners like to hear about. Now, the magnif- you started, I think, I think your first team debut was under Howard Wilkinson, and then you graduated through a big friend of mine, George Graham. No idea how you did or didn't get on with George. I loved him. But we, well, uh, straight away, I'll, I will always say that with George Graham. I, I've been lucky enough to have great managers in my time. I've had a couple of uh, strange ones. <laughs> uh, but the first two that you just mentioned there, Howard Wilkinson and George Graham, were probably the perfect kind of start for me to see what managers are actually like in a first-team environment. Why were they perfect? They, they, there, there are certain similarities in character traits between Howard and George. They, they're all they're very intense, very detailed. They're cautious. I don't know if cautious is the right word. They have very crystal clear ideas on personal behaviour, training, and how to play. They, they, they were. Now, my time with Howard Wilkinson wasn't as long as um, people, I think, um, realise. I mean, I only played a couple of games for him, trained, you know, a few times uh, with them and all that. I mean, we were always brought in as a five or six players into the, the first team to, to train with the first team. So my connection with Howard Wilkinson, who I have a lot of time for now, um, I, I, I see him on coaching courses. I see him um, when I did my pro licence, I sat down with him and, and spoke uh, at length with him. Uh, so I do get on well with him and I'm very grateful that he gave me the opportunity. Uh, but again, realising his strategies, his ideas, uh, getting involved with the first team, especially at a young age, was, was fantastic for me. And then really to kind of grow into that next phase where George Graham, now, even when George Graham did turn up at Leeds, I wasn't like in his first team straight away. I had to work my way into his team. But George Graham had this kind of <laughs> presence that when he walked the halls of the, the training ground, you actually stood to attention. And you looked at yourself and said, am I presentable? Am I this? Am I with my socks up? Is, is everything right? Because he was one of these people that would look at you and go, you're working now. You know, so outside, right, I hope you, you look after yourself. But when you hear there's a structure, you know, there's a discipline, there's, there's all these things that I want to make you not only a better player, but a better person as well. And I love that, you know, because I, 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 I think that that just put me in good stead. Look, I grew up with my dad quite strict as well. And so I grew up in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment where everything had to be done right anyway. Rules and standards. Yeah, rules and standards, you know, because my dad worked a full-time job, but he always had, you know, proper standards. You know, mm. he, he had this kind of sense of, you know, I want to teach you to be, you know, uh, into the real world, you know, become, you know, a, a man straight away because you're coming into an environment that's very tough. What and would like he say, have taught you that served you well under, say, George? I just had to be respectful, mm-hmm. to be, uh, you know, to um, to go out there and do your job properly, mm-hmm. you know, because he never said, if you're going out there to do a job and you half do it, mm-hmm. you know, your boss is only going to go out there and do it again. Mm-hmm. So just go out there and do it properly the first time. So that, that was installed in me at a very young age. So going in there and seeing George Graham and walking the horse out and you pay attention that when he spoke, you listened. And, and, and that's, that's, that's a big thing for me, right? I, it grates me even to this day where you would explain a session, right? And a coach will go through it all and he'd go, does everyone understand? And everyone would go, yes. And then straight away you're getting to the drill and people make a mistake and it infuriates because I don't understand. If you do not understand it, just put your hand up and go, boss, what is it? You don't have to do it in front of the team, just, just speak to me. And I think people got shocked because I did it all the time. 
because I wanted to make sure that I was doing the right thing that my manager wanted if I didn't understand it. Now, if my manager's quite crystal clear <laughs> and I know exactly what it is, then I, I wouldn't ask him. But if he asked, if he was doing a certain position, certain formation, and he wanted me in a certain way, and Benitez was, was big at this, I'd always pull Benitez and I'd say, boss, this is what you want me to do, da, 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 da. And he would go, yes, or he'd go, no, 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 this is... I'd say, oh, now I know. Because I didn't want to be that person to make the mistake, because it just it infuriates me. Supplementaries, not to go away from this, this is absolutely key. First of all, now I'll come back to George and presence, because I'd really like it, it's a difficult one. Can, can you define presence? And in this series of interviews, we went up to the north of Sweden to sit with Sven Joran Eriksson. He was like, Mancini's this and Mancini's that. And he stopped and he went, but he's no David Beckham. And, and Sven Joran Eriksson was like, when Beckham comes in the room, I quiver, I, which is a different story, but, but pe certain people do have it. I sat down with Stephen Gerrard um, at training uh, one day and I said to him, you come in a room and around you, everybody, and he's like, I don't do that deliberately. He said, I'm really shy. I don't even know how. So how that happens is one thing. But secondly, you said, I think you hinted in either speaking to George or speaking to Rafa, would you take them aside? Because young men don't like to ask questions that show they haven't understood in front of other young men because in the macho culture, that's like, mm, you haven't quite kept that or it's teasing, whatever. So did you have the confidence to do that in front of the group or did you always do it separately? So again... And I agree with you, a lot of people don't like to do it in front of a group. Now, it's depending on the manager. Now, again, I am quite open. Like, I'm a very confident person. Mm -hmm. So I'll be quite happy to have a conversation with my coach in front of all my players. And I've done that before. Whether they like it or not, it's a different story. Now, I knew, for example, Benitez didn't mind it in front of the, front of the, uh, front of the group, but he also didn't mind it on, on the side. Mm -hmm. But like I said... It wouldn't be if you clearly didn't know. Then I think it's a, it's 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 down to that person naturally. But for me, I had no problem in speaking in front of a, a group of players because I was, I was I was a confident person. And I don't mind making a mistake because I'm a firm believer. You make a mistake, that's how you learn. Yeah. You know, if you constantly sit there and you're you're perfect, you got nowhere to kind of grow. So I think you should be able to push in boundaries and go. Can I do this or can I not do that? And then that's how you learn to grow as a player. I identify well. with that. I completely agree. And I think that I, I personally wouldn't have always felt that way. I have done for the large part of my professional career because, you know, honestly, if I've got a sincere question, I was like, oh, fuck what anybody else thinks, really. And it's only to oh. better me. And I, but not, neither of us, I suspect from what you answered, neither, there are people who ask questions to go like, look, look how clever, you know, look, boss, look at that. Well, that's all the bollocks too. That's not. But if you need to know something to execute your job well, I, I, it, ask. I, yeah, and like I said, I've also argued. Because like you said, you, you, you spoke about me at the start with about how I see the game. Yeah. And if you get a manager that can like, be with you and, and be part of that, I mean, that's how I shine as a player. But if you get a, a manager that's structured and has to be, and like Benitez was a very structured uh, coach, I have to change myself because at the mm. end of the day, he, he's the boss and you have to follow his rules. But like I said, coming into other meetings where I've had coaches where that explains something and I'd be just baffled. And I just, it infuriates me mm. when players don't sit there and then what they'll do is they'll go out there and they'll go, oh, I didn't understand that. I, I, you know, I, I didn't get this. And I'm sitting there going, well, why wouldn't you actually ask? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, a, it's, it's not you being rude or anything. You're just actually asking what do you want me to actually do? Mm -hmm. So when I go out there, I'm not going to get bollocked. Mm -hmm. you know? And I, I just find, and like I said, it's, it's a shame that not enough players actually have the courage actually to do that. But I think you've, you've got to be able to do it at a young age. Mm -hmm. because like I said, I, and then it just gives you more confidence. We're coming to that theme about training ground cultures in a second, but and you can knock this out of the fence if you want. But I go back to you, instinctively, a confident person, instinctively said, George was, you, you straightened your shoulders as you said it. Yeah. What is presence? What I did George he, have? He was an immaculate man first and yeah. foremost, right? Yeah. The way he spoke, the way he conducted himself on and off the pitch. He was very demanding. He had a structure of how he wanted to play. Like I said, he was very clear. And if you didn't do something, he would tell you. <laughs> and he didn't just tell young players. He told his top players. Mm -hmm. And I think that then in a, a, an environment that is like no one's off the hook, you know, because 
if you got a, if you ever have a, a manager that's only having a go at certain players, which are not very managers, uh, not a lot of managers do that, but you've got to be able to have a go at your top player if he's not doing it right. And I think that sets a, a, a one a rule present, for all. Yeah, yeah, and that's how he kind of conducted himself. But like I said, he was there on and off the park. He was that that presence. And like I said, I even when I had a few private meetings with him, the way he spoke to me personally, it was. It was good. You want to see, we, we, there was a spell when I was still living in England where we went out to dinner quite a lot and we talked football. He took a couple of us back late at night to his, his garden, his beloved garden. And um, all the chrysanthemums and the rhododendrons are ordered just like he wanted his back for. And he takes you around with great pride as well. But yeah. he, he treats his flowers with the same sort of you will not wilt type thing as he does his players. Um, Honestly, I'd like to say he's, he's, like a, he's, he's a proper gentleman. Oh, Proper gentleman. And you talked about his elegance off the pitch. He dresses, he still dresses completely elegantly. And he was, he was called apart from stroller because in midfield, gorgeous George, was, gorgeous George, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I see know. your mind goes yeah. the way mine does as well. He's a great, he's he's an absolutely great man, and it's been a joy knowing him. Um, so, this is what you've talked about. I don't know whether it was as as uh, feisty under George, but by the time that your Leeds team is reaching its peak, you've talked about the fact that. Um, on the David earlier, training, training could be super intense. That it effectively it was not quite survival of the fittest. But I'm asking for two reasons. There are a lot of people who listen now who have no idea that that's what British training grounds were like, and that you had to be. That it was a little bit survival of the fittest, and that this idea now we've got about we're extremely careful about diet posture, dentistry, psychology for players. Whereas in the era you trained in, it was like, can you look after yourself? Can you take a kick the day before the game? And in this series, we've had Terry Gibson talk to us about the Friday kick-ups at Spurs, where basically it wasn't even a game, you just kicked the fuck out of one another to be ready for the next day. We've had Graham Souness and Terry Butcher talking about the England versus Scotland at the old training ground outside Ibrox, where again, it was just a war. Michael Carrick talking about a different environment, but ultra intense, so that training for them in that era of Scholes and Keane and Rio and, and Beckman, it was like all the training sessions were harder than the matches, much harder. The weekend, he said, by the time the weekend came. To try and build a proper picture of what training at Leeds in that era was like. So again, we, so when I first came over to Leeds, like I said, I had to learn very quickly uh, how to survive. But like I said, I grew up in a, an environment where I always played with my older brothers as well. So I knew how to deal with myself um, growing up anyway. So coming over here, I knew. And I also felt being over here, my only one time to come back to Australia was once a year. So I knew I was here for good. And plus, I didn't have that comfort of, if I didn't play well, mm -hmm. right? I didn't have the comfort of my parents being here, come mm -hmm. on, I'll take you home and uh, I'll cook you a nice meal, go see your other friends and do that. So I had to go back out in the training park, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I wanted anyway. So I kind of grew up quite quickly. Um, but we all grew up together because we had like Alan Mabry, we had Stephen McPhail, Damian Lynch, Lee Matthews, Paul Robinson. The Youth Cup side, the yeah, Youth Cup winning side. I mean, and... Even now, youth games, like our youth team training sessions was intense. We, when we used to play young v old, it was terrible. I mean, you'd see so much, and I wasn't a tackler, right? The, you know, the one thing I did get taught when I was young is to, uh, to jump high and, and learn to run quickly, right? Because then you won't get, go get caught. So at least I had that too in me. But I used to see some of the challenges, even at that level, right, was intense. And I go, and, and I suppose we had a, a an environment, especially with that youngsters. We had an environment of winning anyway, very early. Mm -hmm. And then even when we went and trained with the first team, like I I, I see youngsters come up now, and you know I, I see it different, you know. And you usually see one or two sometimes can shine, and you think, oh, he's got something. Whereas when we came up to the first team, there was about eight of us that were shining. And sometimes we would actually play the first team off the park. And they would get annoyed, you know, and we'd be end up. I remember one time where Alan maybe met Carlton Palmer and Carlton Palmer looked at him and just turned and said, you ever do that again, I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and was like, yeah. well, I was just trying to get out of the area, the tight area. And I also remember one time 
Well, I, I got cheeky in, in, uh, in, in one of the, the games, and I remember the ball got played over, controlled it well, put the ball on the ground, got it down on my hands and knees, and bang, kind of had it. And all I remember seeing is big David Hopkins two foot me, like that, straight knee in my head, and I end up ducking there like that, just missing it. And he slid past me. And I go, Hoppy, what the? F-? He goes, You ever do that fuck again? I'll make sure I catch you. Yeah. And I was like, oh, Okay, I won't do that again. So that environment was, was, was there in us, but we had a few first teamers as well that was, was tough. But then we had the likes of Lee Bowyer come in, mm-hmm. right? Then we had the likes of Alan Smith coming up. Then we had uh, David Batty come in, and then we had Gary Kelly, who was a feisty person mm-hmm. anyway. And we just started to have this intense training group that was very professional. Like we were great mates off the park. Mm-hmm. That was the one thing that when we all drove in, everyone spoke. And we talk about a team bus, and I, I see on team buses now, everyone's got their little seats and on the phone and, and not talking. Whereas you were on that Leeds bus, everybody would be talking to everybody. It was chaos. I mean, the manager must be thinking, hey, are these actually guys concentrating? Or they're just mucking around. But yeah. we had this environment. It's a bond. Yeah, it? It, it was a huge one. If, if we went out, everyone went out, mm-hmm. right? Everyone stayed out until there was a certain time until you went back. And if you didn't stay, you were in trouble with the team. Right, so we had this environment, but and it was all friends, and we'd always have a laugh. But as soon as we crossed this white line, I don't know, everyone just changed. Everyone wanted to play. I mean, we had what Viduka, myself, Smith, Bridgie, Robbie Keane, Robbie Fowler. They were the strikers, mm-hmm. and there's only two can play, mm-hmm. and only two can be on the bench. So we had to fight. Mm. And and you go back to what you just said about the Man United team. Training was harder, you know, and tackles would be flying, in, and there would be tension because. Players wanted to play. That, again, that's something that over our series, I think we've tried to clear up for the audience that there are certain types of flare-ups where you know two don't like each other, yeah, one of them's about, but in general, there will be flare-ups, it will come, it will go, it will calm down, and 95% of the time, the two players are like, oh, well, I, you know, half a day later or a day later, it's like, cool. It just happens. It's, it's natural. Yeah, well, this, this was slightly different with us because, I don't know, sometimes, I mean, if there wasn't a fight a week at Leeds, yeah. it just wouldn't be the same. Because that's how intense it was. Whether that was just two players boiling over, Mm -hmm. because they had a scuffle a week before and it just boiled over, or someone was just taking the mick, or some or some team was just uh, you know overpowering and another team and they were just you know bickering and all that, or you played young v old, or someone made a decision that you weren't happy with. But like I said, I that created that bond that when we and and the one thing I, I loved about the team was the fact that. The training sessions were tough, they were hard, and there was arguments. But as soon as that finished, it never kind of went off the pitch. Yeah. And then even if it went into the game, it never went into the game as well because you knew that the team was ready to fight on the weekend. And they, they, they had for one back. another. They had your back. Yeah. Wow. And you knew that they were ready. And they were kicking lumps out of each other. What do you think they were going to do to the opposition? <laughs> and that was the great thing about that 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 team of leads because people thought, oh, well, you will, we'll pass this young team off the park. Well, they couldn't pass us off the park because yeah. we could play. Then they say, oh, well, hang on a second, we'll bully them. Well, they couldn't bully us because we had some of the nastiest players in the league. Ah, oh, we could go long. Well, we could deal with that because we're You clear. could do the lot. We, we as a team could do the lot, which that's what I'm saying. That's why I think everyone at that time, Leeds was their second team because mm. they liked their home mm. team, but then they liked to watch this young It was team very attractive forward. football. It was very attractive football. It, 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 was, it was a good time because we had such a, a good connection between us all. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had players like Boya, box to box, mm-hmm. into, uh, into areas where, you know, we used to always say, but how do you score these goals? <laughs> you know? And he got, and I remember I said to him, I said, Bo, you're so lucky. I said, every time you get in that box, you, that ball falls to your feet. He goes, what? He goes, Harry, look at my game. And I actually looked at his game. He makes a run about 40 times a game mm-hmm. to get that ball once. So percentage-wise, yeah. you'll be there as long yeah. as you keep making them. Yeah, that's, and, that's what it, and then when you looked at it, you think, oh, fair enough. But you struck me as different because, and I have gone back to look to try and reconfirm, because your memory plays all kinds of tricks. It appeared to me that you had a very good peripheral vision and a sense of where either by knowing your teammates where a ball might drop or where you might be best available for a pass... But also a lot of the time when you struck the ball so sweetly, you seem to be in more space than you should have been. And to me, that's n- nev- almost never a fluke. Uh, I suppose if you talk about my individual game, and I suppose when I shined the most was when I was allowed to have freedom. Uh, 
I love my left side. I love being able to do it. But when I first started on the left side, look, I was very direct. Mm -hmm. I loved running with the ball. Mm -hmm. um, I loved taking people on. And I hate the saying, you know, you only need to beat him once out of 10. Because the other nine times don't really matter, right? I don't like that saying because that don't get you past him. It's 15, 16, 17 times you've got to keep going. And you've got to keep going at your defender. You've got to make him think. So then he's lost. So, I, I mean, the, one of the main things I, I used to do when I used to play is as soon as I received the ball, if, if the fullback stayed off me 10 yards, I'd whip across him. So he'd think, okay, well, I've got to get nice and down. So next time he'd come in, I'd push it long. Then he'd go, oh, okay. If I come in close, he's going to push it long. If I stay out, like, oh, okay. Next minute, I'd run inside again. Oh, my God. Next minute, he's running inside. But this is beautiful territory. We, 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 in one of our earliest ones, we did with Chris Ward, and we said, can we ask Chris about his art? Because not everybody knows how they do what they do. But you're like him. You do. When you had a rival, did you really very much, Shane Warren, I, I'll I, mix up my bowling and I, just... I, honestly, I would make him think that much that he'd get tired. And if he'd get that tired, that means I'm winning. Yeah. And it's even the same information I, I, I speak to the, my wingers now. Mm. It's like, you've got to be able to move them. Mm -hmm. Now, if, even if you get someone that's tight to you, and then that's what happened. People usually started to just mark me. So then I would be allowed, because of the manager, he'd you say, look, try and find space. I'd say, okay. So what I'd do is I'd go stand on someone else. Mm. I'd take myself out of the game. And then I'd, I'd sit there sometimes, and I'd be looking at these two players marking me, because I'd mark <laughs> one, and he'd mark me, and they'd be thinking, well, what should I do? <laughs> And I'd mark someone that can't physically get out of their position, like a centre-half or a midfielder. And I'd just say to Bo or Batty or Eric Backer, just Look, use that space I've done there. That. I've done that for you. And then they'd think, oh, no, I've got to move. As soon as he'd move, I'd move somewhere else. And then I'd be able to get the space. But I had that freedom of, especially when you're playing a team. Are you in a game within a game mentally there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like, again, you don't see so much of it nowadays because it's very structured. And it's the way that managers uh, want to play their game. They play a very high pressing game. They yeah. want people in certain areas. It's very rare you get kind of a player that's allowed to have that kind of freedom to drift into areas and be able to pick up the ball uh, even behind. Because I used to love sometimes picking up the ball deep. Because that's another thing. If you pick the ball up sometimes deep, how far is that fullback going to actually yeah, come out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then you can have your, 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 your And as long as everybody else in your shirt is on the same wavelength as you, they're like, as soon as Harry's gone there, Give it about five seconds. No, Harry's gone there. Give it five seconds and that space will appear for us. It, it, it used to be funny because when we used to uh, do the team talk, like Eddie Gray used to come out uh, on, on, the, on the pitch. Eddie Gray, one of the all-time greats. Well, that's uh, again, not my favourite. Uh, he was one of my favourites. Ah. And again, I, I grew up with him. He was constantly always pushing me. But when he used to go through the team talk on the pitch, he'd go through everyone's position, da 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 like that, and then he'd go, just give the ball to H. Right? And all the players would just look at me and go... <laughs> Like that. But it worked. It worked. Um, so look, you, you've opened up a different channel because I can't get back to the comparison with training today until I say, I wasn't going to say messy to you, but I am now. Because he's, he's, he, as he's got older, has, you've effectively described what he does. He's like, I will go deep, I'll go, I'll ask them who wants to come in. Irrespective of his terrific brain and his terrific skills, the way you describe that you needed to play once every rival went tight with you. That's effectively in a snapshot of his life. That's how he, he drove Argentina to the World Cup. D did you relish watching that? So I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but then... You don't I've, I've agree. Watched, I've, no, I've watched Messi, and I think he's gone through stages throughout his whole career where he's done the movement thing. But then I think there's, there's been a period where as well where he's actually just stood still, right? And that's one of the hardest things to do as a player. And especially if you're marking that player. Because he's an attacker, he's just standing there. And what happens if he just stands there? You're just going to stand there with him? You can't. Because the defender gets itchy feet. Uh, can, can, gets... Can I, can I, you've made me think. When I watch him standing still, or when you watch him moving and doing something, even after all the years I've been watching him, which is since the first day he played for Barcelona's junior teams, because I was living there, the number of times that you find him in space... And I'll sometimes, you're working in a match and you, you stop and watch him. Nobody, nobody's got the nerve just to say, well, I'm staying with him too. No, it's, it's, I don't know if it's, it's physically it's, or mentally no, impossible, it's, it's but the they hardest, don't. It's, it's, no, it's the hardest thing to do because as an as a, as a attacker, you're just waiting, right? You're, you're waiting for that movement. And you're thinking, okay, if someone's actually physically marking me, if I stand still, right, I'm going to take, take him out. So that means there's a gap somewhere because that player should be in a, a certain area. 
that player will get itchy feet because he knows he's got to be able to cover. As soon as he makes one or two movements, bang, he goes the other way, he gets the ball, he's gone. And that's what you do. That's what, and, and I've seen him do that. And I've looked and I've gone, he actually does nothing in a game, but then, like I said, he's waiting for that right moment where that player just, oh, I've got to help out. Or, like I said, the opposition win the ball and they think, oh, well, I can break off Messi. And then as soon as you break, they win the ball back, bang, find him. But the problem is, is when you have players like that, you've got to deliver. Mm -hmm. If you can have a player that does that and every time you get the ball, he lost the ball, players would be like, no, 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 that doesn't happen. But with players like that, when you actually give the ball, he actually creates something, he creates a chance, he scores a goal, players would go, that's fair enough. And that's what you need. Did you enjoy his World Cup? Yeah, I didn't mind it. Yeah, I, 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 I wasn't like... When I ask that, I often see people jumping forward to tell me about Homer, but le look, less look, so look, with look, you. Look, 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 fantastic that he's won. I mean, he, he's... The whole debate now is like he is the greatest player to have played the game because he's won the World Cup and that. For me, no, because like I said, I I think the the way that the older generation played, like for Maradona and all that, you know, the pitches that they played on, the challenges that they 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 ride. I mean, again, I want to see, and I, I used to love Messi, and I, I, Messi still does it to this day. Mm. Uh, but I, I, it infuriates me seeing wingers now. As soon as they get touched, they go down. They get touched and they go down, and I, and I don't like that. And I try and install it even here with my players, and my players now are starting to do it. I love the fact that a winger gets the ball, he rides a challenge, he pushes off a defender, mm -hmm. and I go, that's what gets people excited. Hmm. You know, that's mm -hmm. what gets people on the edge of the seat to go, oh my God, he's going to get the ball now, and you watch this. Not, he's going to get the ball and fall over. Mm -hmm. He gets a foul, stops a game. He's going to actually get the ball, he's going to ride a challenge, he's going to beat someone, he's going to whip across. That's what I liked, and that's what Messi was great at. Mm -hmm. Look, it's just that he's got to that point. I mean, when he was younger, he was phenomenal. The challenges that he used to ride was mm -hmm. probably the same as was Maradona, but Maradona's was just on another level for him. As you said, he could, at that age, he could run fast and jump high. And what I deliberately, I said before we started recording, I said, I'd like you to paint the picture of what life at Leeds was. I, I, we can't leave that until, you have to explain David Batty as your favourite player. We've, we've, got, we've yeah. got people called socios who've supported us all our lives. And Gareth Scriven writes in, David, he knows too, David Batty is Harry's favourite player. Whatever happened to David after his playing days, you never seem to hear him from him anymore, which is a separate question as to just bottle up your admiration for David Batty. So, uh, so I was playing, obviously, for Leeds, and my first encounter with Bats was with when he was at Newcastle. Mm -hmm. So, and I remember we were playing up at St James's Park, and I remember the ball came in just in our half line, and I remember going up for a header, and Bats was coming in, and he went bang, elbow, straight across my upper lip, cut me seven stitches up there. And I remember going on the bus, and I was trying to talk, and all the players were laughing at me, this, that, and the other. And in that, I think in that January, I think we signed him. Mm -hmm. And I remember going up, because I was the, like, the main player, and so I remember going up to Bats, and like, I'd seen Bats play, and I knew what he was like, and all that. I remember going up to Bats, hi Dave, you know, introduced myself, da da da. I said, oh Bats, can I just ask you a question? He goes, yeah. I said, up in St. James's Park, why did you elbow me? I said, he goes, I don't know. And just walked off. And I just went. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was his character. He wasn't like, he, he was funny, but he just come in, done his work and, and, and went home. And people always say, oh, you've played with some fantastic players. And mm -hmm. I have played with some fantastic players. But for me, the best players are the most simplest players. The ones that never give the ball away. Right now, Bats never gave the ball away. Never gave the ball away in training. Never gave the ball away in the game. Knew his role, understood his role, and gave the ball to players that could do the better job. And that was him. And I think when you go back to, everyone talks now about the holding midfielder. That is one of the main positions <laughs> of football. Everyone talks about Makaleli. Everyone talks about Fernandinho. Bats started that. I believe. He was the first one in the England squad for Newcastle, for Leeds. And, and I saw him most at Leeds, and even in Blackburn, but most at Leeds where I said he just sat in front of that, the two and a half, broke everything up, mm. solid in his challenges, kept to his job, mm. got the ball, won the ball, played the ball, looked for me a lot of the time, gave me the ball, and then just covered me. And I think as a player like me, the one that drifted around, wanted to see certain areas, sometimes didn't do the defending side, he would be there. And that's what I loved about players. I don't, like you can talk about great players doing this, great ball, this, 
I love simple players that play the game simple because football's not difficult. It's a simple game. Get the ball, play it forward into a position where someone's easier. That's a really big position. please. If you, the, one of the hardest things to do is to make football simple. It's one of the things that people say about Busquets, one of the things that people maybe said about Carrick for sure. And it, Batty's work was in a real sort of war zone if he was breaking things up or if he was receiving the ball under pressure from a centre half or whatever. So he's making your life or other players simple. I mean, he's doing the right thing for the team, but he's actually working in a very industrial area where actually it's more difficult to be simple because getting rid of it quickly, if you hear thundering hooves, is, is, wasn't a temptation for him, but it must be a temptation. No, but, but, but again, like everyone used to go, oh, shoot David, shoot David. But David knew his limitations. And he just thought, why would I shoot? Why wouldn't I not give the ball to someone that's a better shooter than me? And like I said, it's... Football's not difficult. Mm -hmm. It's a simple game if you play it properly. Mm -hmm. And do you stay in touch? With bats? Yeah. No. Does anybody? <laughs> no. No, I don't think so. Gareth, is your answer. Look, we make the leap now, Harry, because um, training in general, particularly at elite clubs, is so different now than what you described at Leeds, what you came through. Uh, an environment that helped you, that you patently enjoyed, you've still spoken about with great affection and enjoyment. But that the whole idea now is that footballers, probably correctly, get treated like racehorses. It's everything to make them fit, fine-tuned, mentally ready. There will be flip. There are not will be. There are flare-ups at training grounds and bounce matches and all that. That's fine. However, that has is it almost a hundred and eighty degree picture from what you described to where you're working now, where. It's evident, I'm going to have to praise you, I'm sorry, but we've seen Maeda talking about, I mean, the, the words he uses for your ability to teach and convince and show, which are phenomenal traits for a coach to have. He talks about coming to Celtic and didn't see any chances for him at all. Then he talks about you stopping, saying, this is what you like, this is what you should be doing. Talking about individual meetings, accompanying to training, don't worry about making mistakes, just keep trying. That process, that, sorry, that sort of professorial teaching um, process, which I think is akin to teaching your kid maths in lockdown where it's like detail and focus and all that, that that's so far away from, from what you grew up in, isn't it? Not personally with me because when I grew up, I had a coach similar, so he broke everything down for me. And I don't know whether it's kind of installed in me. So, for example, striking a ball. I can teach someone that's never uh, struck a ball before, I can teach him how to strike a ball. Mm -hmm. And now I could just say, go and strike a ball. Then I could break it down. Then if you can't do that, I'll break it down again. I could break it down to the point where I could actually get him stand still and go through it because that's how I got taught. And I don't know how it's just kind of broken down for me as a youngster, how I got taught that I've remembered it wow. and been able to see it. And like I said, I, I, even when I played, I, I see a lot of things. But because I'm up here and I, and I work with the attackers, I, I look at their individual movement patterns. And like I said, that's how I broke my things down. And when you see traits of what you could do or they do, and again, it's not about you know, comparing yourself to them because no player wants to hear about you. It's about them. Right? You can only talk to them because they do like stories because you just can't want to tell them, you know, facts and all this, that and that, because they'll get bored. But if you tell them a story that goes with it, they'll listen to it. And when you, when you speak to the players, it's just about trying to get them what, what's the best movement for them. Because their best movement may not be my best movement, but if I'm trying to teach them, mm -hmm. because the one thing I've, I constantly say to when parents come up to me or when I was uh, coaching at a younger level, oh, you know, You'd, you'd, you'd ask a player or a player would go, oh, my favourite player is Messi. I want to be the next Messi. I want to... It's like, you can't be the next Messi because you, have, you don't have his traits. One, you're six foot, right? He's not, right? Two, you're a different, you're, you're different running patterns, different stuff. Be the best person you can be. And I think that's what helped me as a youngster. When people used to go, oh, who's your favourite player? I'd, I'd be like, no one. They'd be like, no one. I, I want to be my favourite player. So I want to work on myself. And I don't get when people want to compare themselves to, to other players because they've got nothing. You've got to get the best out of what you get. And that's when I look at Dizan or Jota or Haxa or Abada, I look at them and I look at what are they great at and let's work on that. 
And then that's when you sit down and after you get a certain amount of games under it, you can see, you can see patterns. Mm -hmm. And once you see them patterns, you work it out there. And then when you work it out there, and, and we go back to even when you talked about the United lot, and even with, with Leeds, you know, training has to be harder. Mm -hmm. Training has to be harder. And I always go, it's like working on the West End, right? You look at them performers, right? When they're building up to a show, they're working every single day and they're working hard that when they go out on the Saturday show, they know their line's perfect. And they can put a smile on their face because they're that confident in their job to go out there and put on the best show. There's no difference as a footballer. You work hard during the week, get everything right, scoring goals, getting past people, feeling good. You walk out on that pitch on Saturday thinking, well, I've scored 100 goals in training. I've gone past my defender 50 times. I am ready to take on this person. There's nothing here that worries nothing me. Nothing here that worries me because I'm ready personally. It's when you don't do it, you know, and we go even back to what you just said there about the whole thing about training and aspect. And you talk about their racehorses, they are, right? But, and I was only speaking this to the other day with one of the, the, the fitness guys. And sometimes, because I'm back in the old school, I'm like, no, 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 we've got to work out there, we've got to work out. But you've got to think about the amount of games that these guys play as well. You know, and they have to eat right. They have to sleep right. They have to recover right. Because we talked about our seasons, we'd sometimes play 40 games and everyone go, oh my God, 40 games in a season? Wow, that's huge back in the day. Now they're playing up to 60. And then they get a week off and then they're back into pre-season again. And then they're playing again. So I think the whole off-field eating, recovering and all that kind of stuff, I think that is so important. But the one thing that you don't want to do is to, you still want to allow them to have the freedom to think out there. You know, because that's what football is. It's about, because if you play completely to a structure, right, you, you play completely to a structure, everyone will work it out and they'll go, well, this is what they do on a structure. You've got to be able to let players decide when they're out there what they can do to change a game. And it's very hard. It's very hard because we have a lot of managers out there that, you know, are very, uh, you know, very structural in how they want to do it. But if you have a manager that goes, hey, this is how I want to do it here, but... You've got to be within free these enough. parameters. Yeah. My rules at this in this situation in a breakdown and a transition. When you reach that mark, you've got to be show able yourself. to make your show own yourself. decision. You've got to be able because if you have that decision made for you, then you know people will figure it out. But if you're being out there and being able to to change it, then you'll always make opposition question. I, I really liked two things in what uh, Deshamada said. He'd obviously been scared of making, well, making mistakes. For the little I know of the Japanese culture, that might have been partly what you inherit, what you live through, that that can be dishonourable. Um, but also, he, he said a really interesting thing, but he, because he was a good player, good athlete, he didn't think he had to watch football. You've taught him, you've shown him things. I like the process, and I'm not trying to say that the other coaches aren't doing the same. I'm not trying to mm, say no. Harry Harry Uber Alice. But he specifies that you're the best educative coach that he's ever had in football. That process of being able to get inside somebody's head, understand maybe where there's a little bit of misunderstanding or misapprehension and then correct it. I'd imagine that must be immensely satisfying. Oh, it is. Yeah. It is. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I'm blushing. I mean, I, when, he, when he had wrote that, I was like, wow, that's, that's very nice because as a player, you're doing it on the pitch. You know what I mean? And, and don't get me wrong, don't think that I never had help. I had, a, I had a coach back in Australia that used to send me videos when I went through bad times and I used to go be able to talk to him and he'd get me back on track again. You know, so, and the one thing I, I suppose as well that some of these players may forget is that in my career, I've, I've been at the top, but I've also been down the bottom and I've also had to work my way back up again. So I know what it takes. But again, it, it goes back to that, that thing about David Batty, simple. You know, finding out what you're good at. And again, if you can adjust, and I'd have to say with, with Dizan, he's a very good listener and learner. So what you say to him, like he'll listen and he'll take it on board. And even when I have my meetings with my, my players, it's not about, I'm the coach, you're the player, you listen to what I say. No, 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 we're just in an environment where you to have a chat. Like if I'm gonna say something that can, can be completely wrong, but I want to see if you pick up on it because that means you're going to be confident enough to be able to go, hang on, sir, I don't, I don't agree with that, right? And then I know that they're listening. 
because otherwise they just sit there and they just oh. go, yep, yep, okay, yeah, yeah. And then by the time, like, half the time people don't want to go into meetings because they just want to go do their other things. That's a high stress here. situation because if you put a little decoy in there and they don't pick up and they don't say anything, oh, your, oh, your oh, opinion oh. of them goes down and then you're going to have to take them no, off. No, 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 no. It, it's just like... I like I, it. I, I, will, I will question it. I'll go, you sure about that? And then they'll, ooh, okay. And then they'll think about it. But like I said, it's... I will first... My first question I'll always say to my players is, what did you think? And like at the start, they were shy. Now, I mean, I, I, I could spend an hour here with Jota. You know, and, we'll, and we won't even start with the video and, and we'll be talking about it. And then, like I said, I said, certain players have to have a certain demand. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you're an attacker, you, you have to be quite demanding. You know, and I even got to the point where I even rang Ian Hart. I said, Hart, what was I like as a player? He goes, I just gave you the ball. I just gave you the ball. And, you know, I said, but was I demanding? He goes, yeah, you were demanding, but... That's what you want, you know? And so some of these players, again, maybe they're shy because they're still, they're still young. Some of them are quite young. Yeah, they're, they're still young. And, you know, they're, they're playing in a very, like, one of the biggest clubs in the world. So the pressure as well. And I even go back to even with, like, my first impressions, you know, in Scotland, you think, ah, oh, Celtic, Rangers, you know, they, they dominate the league and all this. I think, okay, when I, then being here, the amount of pressure is on the Celtic team to win every day. It's tough. I mean, the draw's not good enough, you know, and, but we deliver that every day in training. We put pressure on them in training to deliver that. So, and the manager puts pressure on us to make sure that we're delivering the sessions that he wishes. And then when that goes out there, the players are ready for it. See, there's, there's one of my comparisons because life's moved on and for, for however entertaining it was to live that Leeds training ground, and, and I'm trying to identify that, Dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of more training grounds were similar, if not identical. Yep. I think my question is, what's the... You, you, it's not the identical thing that causes the spirit, because you, you, largely you're not doing what Hopkins said. But there has to be something that... Is it personal demands? Is it... You've got, you got to also underthink as well, in, in, even in football, I mean, even to the ones back when we started, like, even if you signed a contract, right, for five years, Normally, three players would stay there three, four years, right? Nowadays, you could sign a contract for five years. Mm -hmm. You'd be out the door in six months. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I, it's trying to build a culture mm -hmm. that's tough as well. So mm -hmm. you usually find if there's a team that has a good core of 12 to 14 players and you get, that's when you get that kind of... They pass it yeah, on they, to they, every they, guy that they, walks they, in the door. Because everyone, because you've got enough people in there to drive yeah. the sessions yeah. and, 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 and to drive that. So I, I and I always hear... And you always try to get these meetings with other culturals and uh, other sporting. Yeah. Um, and, they, and they go, and the one thing I don't understand, especially in Australia, like AFL and rugby, oh, we've got this team bond. Got this. And I always point out, I go, why don't you create that in football? I said, man, you guys sign for a club and you're there for 12 years. So that person is there, unless he's a superstar and, he, and, and very rarely they, they move on, oh. but they're there for the, virtually their whole career. Okay. So they can be involved in that whole setup for 12 years. I said, as a footballer, you could be there for one year, you could go to another club, then another club, then another club, and you could be chopping and changing. Each one with a completely different completely culture, Completely different culture. So I find it difficult. So again, yeah. this is where you get that kind of individual kind of footballer that has to make sure he does his job properly, then then fits in with the, the, the rest. Otherwise, it's very hard. Before we move to Liverpool, I'm sorry, I'm going to embarrass you with more praise. Liam McLaughlin, one of our socios who sports us. Morning, G. Welcome to Glasgow. As a Celtic season ticket holder, the improvement we all see, particularly in Maeda, but also Abada, it's unbelievable this season. Maeda technically came on barrel loads. Abada's now standing men up 1v1 and more often than not getting the better of his man. We suspect Harry is to credit for this. Are we correct? I think we've answered that question. I'm not going to put you on the spot. You can certainly answer it if you want. No, but look, we, I'm look, sharing the praise because you deserve it. Yeah, but again, we, we're a team here. Yeah. We all, we yeah, all yeah. work together. And again, this is, is not a just about me doing it. It's just that, again, you know, it's what I was born and bred on is taking defenders on. And I just, it inf I, look, it's actually easier for these guys to take players on than to feel my wrath after the game if they haven't taken them <laughs> on. Okay. <laughs> so they're actually learning uh, to actually, you know what? I I'm taking them on. On my tombstone. I'm taking. <laughs> we fucking just did what he asked us to because he's a pain in the arse. They if can I, write that on my tombstone. Because if I don't, <laughs> I'm going to be getting in the Any year. Any recognition, man? <laughs> I, 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 like I said, every I love time, it. I love I, it. When I'm on the videos and they and they pass the ball back, I put a thing. I go, what the hell? <laughs> 
again, <laughs> what the hell? And they're like, uh, oh. Oh, very and then they go, I know, I know. And, and they know when it's coming up, they go, I know, I don't need to look at it, I know. <laughs> yes, I said, well, what are you thinking there? Man, you'd have made a good teacher. I mean, you wouldn't have earned much money, but you'd have made a good teacher. You really genuinely would have done. It's about, um, it's about exactly, oh, it's 12 off 23, 11 years since she scored twice against Brisbane Roar in a 3-2 defeat to an Ange Postecoglou team. He was the one that was tasked um, by your federation with changing the era and you and a number of guys didn't get selected anymore for the national team. Um, from what you understand of him now, what brought you two together again? What, what, what made him say, that fella? Well, you, you, I don't know. I mean, look, I suppose we go back to the, the Australian thing and when he took over, I mean, again, the one thing with the manager, he'll tell you to your face. Mm. And I love that. Whether you're a player for him or you're playing not for him, it doesn't matter. As long as, you, as long as the manager will tell you to your face, you're happy. Right? You might be happy with the outcome, but you think, fair enough, at least he's told me. And his words need to stand the test of time. They yeah. don't need to blow away in the no, wind. No, they don't need to blow away. And yeah. I remember we, we went for a coffee in Melbourne and it was well short and sharp because he really got to the point. You know, I'm not selecting you for the Australian team. You know, he gave me his reasons. And, you know, I was, like, I was gutted. There's no question about yeah. it. But I just thought, okay, fine. And I didn't really want to stay there much longer. And I think no. he didn't. So we kind of left at that. And I thought, okay, well, maybe that was, maybe that was it. You know, and, 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 you know, I shook his hand, said, thank you, congratulate you. Well, you know, good luck with everything. And I think he'd done a, an exceptional job with the Australian team. And I think he's worked hard to get to where he's got to, mm -hmm. you know, because he's, his path's been up and down. Uh, but recently, it's been a lot of ups. Um, and then uh, when he first came in here, uh, he, he came in to have a look at what was happening. And then uh, I had originally just got the Barnet job. Uh, and I was working down there. And then obviously, um, things happened there. And then in the summertime, I was talking to a club. Uh, and then, let's just say I, I was talking to the club on Monday. Then I received a, a, a text message off the manager and I was taken back of what he said. It was just one of the nicest messages uh, that I've yeah. ever read from a manager to, uh, to a, a wow. young coach. Okay. And I remember showing my wife, and my wife just looked at me and said, well, I said, well, there's nothing like, you know. I said, I'm gonna ring him. So I rang him and he, he spoke to me. He, he told me that he'd love for me to, to join up. Um, he, he knows the difficulties that I've been through. He's kept an eye on me, didn't know that. So he had, he had known what I'd been up to. He knows what I'd like, what I didn't like. And he just said, I think this would be a good environment for you to come in and, and see, to work with a great team, um, to be able to get back to where you belong. And I was blown away. I didn't know, I was like, okay, um, yeah. And I remember just, I'll, I'll get back to you, right? Like literally, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. And, he goes, yeah, yeah, no problem, take time, da 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 and It's left, okay, okay. And I said to my wife, I said, it was like, it's nothing, like, right, I'm taking this job because yeah. the way he spoke was yeah. enough for me to say, yeah, I, I just didn't want to make him sound too eager, you know, I just had to make hmm. him wait a little bit. <laughs> but hmm. I was ready to say yes then straight away. And then I remember going through everything and everything was sorted and I just wanted to come up here and again, be part of a, a winning team, but the, the, the winning mentality, you know, of, of what he is. And I've heard a lot of stories about the manager, but they're stories. And it's nice to get your own picture, yeah. your own ideas. And yeah, he's, this. I, I think personally there's two sides to him. One is the, the manager, he's very strict, very, you know, he, he likes the way things are run and he's very um, intense with the way he wants. And I like that. Mm -hmm. And I felt that coming in here, it's gonna take me a couple of weeks to learn, you yeah, know, his ropes. ideas yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Within two days, I understood it. Because that's how clear his messages are. Hmm. You know, they're not, there's no black or white, it's just gray, just, just straight. There's no, 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 no sorry, there's just, it's just yeah. black. Let's just say it's just black. That's, that's the way we're yeah. playing, that's how it is. This is what I want. And I was like, oh, this is pretty easy. Like, like coming into it. But then there's the other side of him, where he's like a father. You know, he's, he's got that, that personality to joke around. And very rarely, you know what I mean? Because like I said, but when you do catch him on them times, he's, he's just a generally a nice person to talk to. And they're the people that you want to work for. Mm -hmm. You know, as much as he's intense as a manager and all that, he's genuinely a good human being. 
and mm. they're the ones that you want to work for. In football, is that slightly rare? Uh, I, uh, for me, like I said, I've only been a, a manager. This is the first time I've been a coach. So I've working for managers is different, I suppose, because then you yeah. work for someone, so you've got to try and figure out what they're like. Yeah. So again, this is the first time that again, but like I said, he's generally, he's a nice person, but first and foremost. My point is football, I'm, I'm really, I'm really asking more of a question about football because it's rare and in all my interviews, which go beyond this, I've been doing this for 30 years. You don't often hear somebody say he's genuinely a good person. In, in a good, often you'll say that with somebody who's been treated badly by the game. The game teaches you to be duplicitous, yeah, yeah. to survive. I, I yeah, think, yeah. I'm oh, not putting words in your mouth. 100%. It's a brutal, nasty industry, yeah. as much as we love it. It's rare to yeah. hear somebody say that and about somebody successful, in my opinion. I, I think that comes, again, from, from him wanting to help. Like I said, he's confident enough in his ability mm. that he's sitting there, well, I can help. Mm. I think it's when people are maybe not confident enough, they want to kind of, hey, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I want definitely. to protect this, I want to protect definitely. that. No and like question. I said, if you're confident enough in your ability, like I said, I'm very open. Right? I, 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 I like arguments. I, I like to be able to fight about questions and all that, but I don't know all the answers. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. And if someone in my, my group has the right answer and it's right for that, I would go with that. You know, I don't like sharing. Like training session, I, I I remember speaking to the J, JK um, the other day, Good man. and he had to uh, put a session on plan this that and I said, why do people do that? He goes, oh well, you just put it out there, you share it, and I said, yeah, but these are the secrets of what you do, yeah. and I don't get it. I I I don't I don't get. It. He goes, oh well, you know, I I don't mind because someone can use it, but I use it for something different. A couple I of times just, in I my like, career that's happened. I went to at the peak of Spain, winning three tournaments in a trot. I went to Hines Melendez in the Federation and he was like, well, at the end of this interview, I'm off to Burton, wherever the England, to, to, yeah. to, to do a lecture. I was like, the fuck are you sharing for? He said, well, we'll keep moving on. By the time they've caught up, we'll be on. I was like, I, I get oh, that. all right. I and get the, that. The other one was, um, who, who did I talk about? Shit. Aspire, the Aspire Academy in Qatar. Yeah. I was invited over to be the interviewer for Cruyff who turned out to be his last ever interview, sitting in front of him. And there were 30 or 40 elite clubs with either coaches or director of footballs or academy. They're, and the idea was just to share. It was revolutionary in football because normally, you know, if you've got a fucking phone number, you don't share it. Yeah, but I, I, but I think the, the game's cut up so much now anyway. Right? Everyone's always looking at it and we have enough people here watching this, that and the other. Yeah. I just think there's moments, whether you're putting on the right thing, whether you're just giving them a, a blow away kind of session, I get that. But I, I think it's nice to have certain things. Uh, that are kept in no, within your uh, your own kind of home. Last section before you um, hit the road. I was at um, Real Madrid against Liverpool, second leg, uh, working the other week, and at the end of it, Real Madrid put on You'll Never Walk Alone because when they played at Anfield in the first leg, the 5-2 game, um, sorry about that, uh, it's still we for, for you, isn't it, Liverpool? Yeah, you yeah. talk as a yeah, fan, yeah. yeah. Amancio, the president, had died in Liverpool, had just been utterly brilliant about recognising that. So at the end of the second leg uh, there, Real Madrid just went straight to You'll Never Walk Alone. And the Real Madrid fans stood up and, and, and applauded. And I, gestures of respect like that are very unusual in football. Um, well, I think that's two th great clubs coming together. That's what, that's what Madrid respect. felt. I think, I think two clubs that respect each other, two big European clubs. It's the right thing to do, yeah, isn't it? Of course it? it is. I think we're starting to see that now with a lot of clubs now respecting it. You know, a lot of things that are, that are happening with certain players, certain clubs. And I think that's, that's nice. It, and, and as a piece of me, listen, as an Aberdeen fan, uh, I'm not going to get all fucking lush. I'm glad. It. But, as a, but as, a, as a Liverpool fan and a Celtic employee, you like that music? What, you'll never walk alone? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Inspirational? You know what? Uh, when I first heard it at, at um, Liverpool, when I went there as an opposition for Leeds, I didn't even hear it because uh -huh. I was focusing, <laughs> right? And and yeah, good. just not even, not even like that. And, and it was like, mate, I'm there to do a job. I'm not there to be listening and, and looking around, right? And it never, like when I went to Anfield as a player against Liverpool, he'd be like, well, I'm here to do my job. I don't care. Like, and I don't get when people go to stadiums and go, oh my God, this is Anfield. A lot this is of old people do that, yeah. I don't get it. It's like, well, take that away. You're still 11 against 11 on a green pitch. Just do your job. Don't worry about what they is because they could be fans of your home team. Just concentrate on your job, all right? If you score, 
they're either going to boo or they're going to they're going to cheer. Don't really matter. But then when I went as a as a as a Liverpool player, it's not hard to notice it when you're in the in the tunnel, and especially when we had the tight tunnel, you'd hear it, and that's when I started to hear it properly, you know. And it was it was lovely because then you could go out and appreciate it, and you'd have that moment where you could look up at the at the clock uh, the cop end and 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 see it and just go, oh yeah, revel. And then I realised what other players must feel because I used to speak to players on the park and go, I mean, why aren't you playing? And they'd be like, oh man, we're at Anfield. You know, you just, you know, we're happy to take a draw, right? So then when I've come to, to Celtic Park and I first heard it, because I haven't heard it for a long time, and especially at the start of the season, I heard it, it was like, wow. I remember hearing it, I was like, and hearing 60,000 people sing it is, is fantastic. And I kind of put myself in, a, in one of the Celtic players and the opposition, and I could see the opposition going, oh my God, this is quite intimidating, you know. Uh, but I, I, I would love that. I would love that. How's your voice? If you sung it at karaoke, would you carry it off? <laughs> uh, probably after a... <laughs> couple of washes. <laughs> a couple yeah, of, a, a nice glass of bread. <laughs> yeah, Spanish. Probably, yes. Wine, for example. Yeah. To what extent have you enjoyed um, the, those Klopp years as, as a fan and now they're talking beyond your professional employment at Celtic now? Um, and for example, as his squad stands now, where, where would your best front, front three in a Klopp team right now be, given all of the options that he's got to, to work with? Because it's, it's a little bit like you're listing off the, the lads at Leeds. Oh, uh, choosing well is, is not easy. Choosing, yeah, I know. I look... Everyone's having a go at him, right? And I just think Liverpool are going through a transition stage. I mean, they've been the, the best, well, one of the best clubs in Europe for the last five years, right? They've been phenomenal. Yeah. And you've seen them just grow up. I mean, making finals and semifinals and going for trophies, it takes its toll, mm. right? And everyone knows there's, there has to be a, a, a changeover of guard. And I think that's what's happening now. Mm. And don't forget, we're missing one or two important players as well. I mean, Luis Diaz is is, is been out, and I know he's he's, he's only coming back. And yeah. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Jota. Yeah, I think he's fantastic. I mean, Salah just speaks for himself. So if there's a three, Salah has no, to be no, in no, it. Not yet. Ah. Not yet. Not yet. He speaks for himself. Yet. But I love Nunes. I think he's fantastic. I know a lot of people are out there a question, but I think there's something there, and I I believe. When you hear what Klopp says, what he does in training, it's just not coming off for him yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's getting his shots away and it's just, we're talking, you know, a couple of centimetres here or there, mm -hmm. left or right, and they're going in, and except it's just nicking the keeper and they're, and they're making the saves. I think there is going to be a change. Uh, and I will probably be, and this is terrible for me for saying this, because he has been like the, the, the God. He is the God, you know, and there was only one God at, at Liverpool. Robbie Fowler. Now I think there's a new one with, with Mo Salah. You know, I think what he's done is, is phenomenal. But sometimes there's, there's always needs to, there, there needs to change. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of Diaz, like I just said. I think mm. he's fantastic. And I love Jota. And I like to see Nunes. I think they could be the next three that are coming up I when that happens. Point. I get your point. When that happens, that's up to the, the manager because Mo Salah is still an unbelievable player. But I think... He generally, when these players get fully fit, he's generally going to be tested. Complete licence now. This is hypothetical. Complete hypothetical. Licensed. In the best of the Klopp era, in which position does Harry Kuehl play? You're in. You're, no, I'm in. I'm in. I'm, left side. I'm picking left side. you. Left side. Left of the front three. Yeah, left of the front three. Coming inside, going outside. No, look, I'm, I'm not a big believer of coming inside. I would just be on the outside. Whipping them balls in, and therefore my question is: You wouldn't do the modern fashion? No, I don't. Inverted. I, I'm a no. I, I don't like that. Tell me why. Explain why. I'll, I'll tell you the perfect reason why is because I felt I could do that until I got told by one of my favourite coaches, Frank Reichart, yeah. and he told me he told me a story once. He goes, "Have you ever seen a cheetah run?" Right. <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard the, the story, no. right? And I remember you pulling me up at Galatasaray and uh, he, he was sitting there going, have you ever seen a cheetah run? And he goes, if you ever see a cheetah run in full motion, his tail's up. And that's the balance, okay. right? So as okay. he's running left, right, he's chopping chains, he's trying to catch it, but he's actually got his tail to balance. He goes, that's you on the left side. Wow. And I looked at it, he goes, when I see you on the right side, he goes, the cheetah's running with his tail between his legs. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, Really? He goes, yeah. And I went, oh, okay. And I went, 
And when he goes, he goes, yeah, you're just not balanced enough. Because, and, and he's right, because I wasn't Iron Robin, where Iron Robin was, yeah. I think he was the best player to be able to cut inside and shoot. And I think everyone saw that and thought, oh, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Right? But there's only one of him. And I was, I was more of an assist person than a goal scorer myself. So, and when he had said that in a way, I, I went back to my original. Like I said, sometimes you need a reset of, of a certain, yeah, of, yeah. A, of a coach or a something to be able to reset yeah. you. And I went back to that and I started to enjoy myself again because I was doing things that were natural to me. Instead of being able to come inside and think, oh, I've got to play a little one-two of this where I was like, well, no, I don't have to come inside and play a one-two. I could come inside and play a one-two, but the ball was coming in there, then I could shoot across goal or I just take my player on. So when he had said that, I felt for me, if I was to play in any team now, it would be high left. Yeah. And was your tail, this is the last one, I think, your tail up or down, and had you come from the right or left, and right up might have been the coach, when you scored the header in the Super Cup final for Gala, uh, to coming from the left, coming, coming from, from the left. I remember I just came on. I remember coming on there like that and I remember making a run around the corner there like that. Stopped there for about half a second. We ended up playing the ball, coming there. Hassan Sass went down the wing. He'd done his little Cruyff, little Cruyff cut and then he just remember clipping it back. And I say this to my players all the time. I said, and I try to get their distance right because me running onto the ball is a lot easier than me just being in a position standing jumping. And a right back, if he's in the right position, he will be covering the far post, mm -hmm. around about six yard box. Now, if you're 10 yards off that running onto a ball, he's standing jumping from a standstill position. I'm running and jumping. Mm -hmm. There's no way he's gonna beat me in the air. And usually you'll be able to get in front of him and you'll be able to score. And I remember that ball just coming up there and I remember the fullback going, oh yeah, I've got this. And all of a sudden I've just leapt from about five yards away and just come over the top of him and, and scored. But it's the only way to, to come onto balls is to, to come onto them, not to uh, stand still. Celtic have signed themselves a very interesting, very astute coach. Um, this has been pure pleasure. It's good to talk to one of life's, in Frank Rijkaard's words, cheetahs, A-A-H at the end, <laughs> cheetah. Um, thank you for being so generous and, and sharing your knowledge with us. This has been really enjoyable. Harry, thank you. Thank you very much. Magic.